All right, good morning. It is Thursday, April 15th, and we are here this morning for an annual visit from the National Guard on uh, so that they can report on their sexual assault uh, awareness and prevention report um, and their report on the sexual assault in the Guard. This is a program that started um, some years ago now and through the initiative of uh, former Representative Gino Sullivan and, and, the, and the General Assembly. And the National Guard has been coming into this committee and or a joint committee with the government operations of the Senate to um, discuss their report. This year takes on um, a different bent because there's been some changes in the, in the leadership structure. And I think that's gonna be reflected in some of what we're hearing today. And so um, we've given ourselves about 90 minutes to hear this report. So we'll let the guard do the report and then we'll go to questions after that. So please just um, let's welcome General uh, Greg Knight, Adjutant General Greg Knight and, um, and his team. Welcome General. Morning Mr. Chair, morning committee. Appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here and I understand certainly the, the challenges with our, our COVID-19 session, but uh, nonetheless, this is uh, good information to share and very important. Uh, as you mentioned, Mr. Chair, this is uh, an annual report. This was initiated some years ago. Um, and in doing so, uh, and I mentioned this to the Joint uh, Guard and Women's Caucus, uh, Vermont has, has become an example for other states. Um, I speak with my counterparts, and uh, they're very interested and curious about how we do things. Um, so that's kind of become a uh, sharing of best practices. So there, there are a number of states now that have followed uh, our lead on this. Uh, so today we're going to present uh, the annual uh, Vermont National Guard report on sexual harassment and sexual assault. Uh, this year, a little bit different uh, with the format. Uh, we've tried to align our information uh, with the desires of the committee, make it a little more uh, readable, user friendly. Um, and the gender report we've included as an addendum to the report on sexual harassment and sexual assault. So we've got a number of folks on today. I may miss somebody. Um, I've got Ms. Christina Fontaine, who's our uh, sexual assault response coordinator for the Army National Guard, uh, Serena Fernari, um, who was our wing sexual assault response coordinator. Uh, Nikki Sorrell, who's one of our victim advocates. Uh, Major Kurt Kafflin, who's our judge advocate general. Uh, Colonel Diane Roberts, who's our joint chief diversity and inclusion officer. And uh, very quickly, a quick introduction so you can actually put a face to the name, our, our provost marshal team, Major Jessica Norris, who's the provost marshal, and Master Sergeant Ken Hawkins, who's the deputy provost marshal. Um, we can talk um, again uh, offline, uh, a whole lot to discuss here. Um, a lot of great progress made by putting this team in place. Um, I'd like to very quickly walk through some initiatives and, and actions that you may be unaware of. I did share some of these uh, with the Guard and Women's Caucus um, earlier. Um, I'll be very brief on these. And again, if, if it's the desire of you, Mr. Chair, or the committee, um, I can follow up uh, via email uh, with an attachment explaining in some detail what these things are and why they're important for us as an organization. Uh, first and foremost, Private Daniel Blodgett, uh, who was accused of sexual assault in February, is no longer a member uh, of the Vermont National Guard. Uh, again, Provost Marshall team's been established. Um, I put them on orders, uh, meaning we have them in essence on active duty with us for a period of two months to get immediately at some of the initiatives we have in place uh, to address the topics we're talking about today. Uh, based on some recent uh, information, I'm addressing a gap uh, in the information flow between civil law enforcement and the Guard. Uh, historically, we've had a great relationship with civil law enforcement, um, but what doesn't happen uh, routinely is a communication when a Guard member is arrested or charged with a crime in Vermont. Um, so I've sent a letter to Commissioner Sherling, and he in turn shared that with the heads of all law enforcement agencies in Vermont uh, to ask a question of somebody being arrested are you currently serving in the Vermont National Guard? That in turn should prompt communication to our provost marshal team and then allow us to much more expeditiously address um, adjudication on the military side. Um, aligned with that, um, I don't know what I don't know. Uh, provost marshal, I I've asked this team to the degree they can to uh, initiate some research into looking into background checks on those who don't have a recent background check because of a security clearance renewal 
or a mobilization. If somebody comes on state active duty or they're mobilized for federal mission, that's part of the in-processing. Uh, it still remains a number of folks within the Guard that have not had an update to a background check, um, but I don't know yet. Uh, Major Norris is working through this um, with local law enforcement to see what we can do uh, to get at folks who have not, for, for instance, reported um, they've been arrested for criminal activity. Um, we have a duty to report. It doesn't always happen. So, uh, and this is not just Vermont. This is a nationwide. I brought this up last week uh, with my counterparts um, in Little Rock, Arkansas at an adjutant general conference. So uh, this is, uh, again, us leading the way in, in how we approach these things. Uh, we're publishing what we call the status of discipline to the force. Uh, this is something that we've never done as a guard. Um, some other states do this. And what this is, is in essence, it's our version of a day in court. Um, our members don't know what happens with adjudication of those charged with a military offense, whether they're discharged, reduced in rank, forfeiture of pay. Um, to me, that serves as a deterrent. Um, I've seen this in climate surveys. So we're going to continue doing this. We're going to put it out quarterly and make sure that our members understand there is closure and there are consequences uh, for those who choose to act poorly. We've published apps uh, for both the Army and Air National Guard, uh, and these are not specific to the National Guard or Uniformed Service. Um, anybody can download these apps. And what's important on the app, um, one thing that's it's apparent to anybody working in this field, and certain to, certainly to me in this position, um, one in five sexual assaults get reported. And, and there's a fear of coming forward and sharing information. Uh, and that is not acceptable. So one of the ways we're getting at this uh, is having within the app is a tile called reach up. Um, you click on the tile and you can view anybody, military or otherwise, can furnish information to the state equal employment manager, the provost marshal, the inspector general, the equal opportunity officer, or, or to me. Uh, and that at least gives us a place to start if we have somebody, again, acting contrary to our standards. And we were interviewing uh, on Friday, actually tomorrow, um, interviewing with uh, the DOD Interim Review Committee. Uh, and this is part of the Secretary of Defense ordered 90 day review of, of policy and our approach to sexual harassment and sexual assault. So that's important for us. We were asked for by name. Uh, and as I mentioned to the caucuses, this is less about me. Uh, this is due to the efforts of the soldiers and, and members of our organization that we have working in this field and the innovation that they're bringing uh, to drive change. So in turn, I share this, I'm on a general officer advisory council. Uh, again, Vermont was asked for uh, with one other state uh, to participate in this because of what we're doing. Um, again, I believe we're leading the way um, and, and this is gonna drive fundamental change within the National Guard. Um, and of course, Friday, we'll, we'll certainly be able to inform uh, the Department of Defense and again, not just me speaking, it'll be members actually working here and, and talking to what works, what doesn't work in areas that we need to focus. Um, for instance, a violence prevention integrator um, that I've asked for uh, as part of a pilot through National Guard Bureau because another underreported crime is, is certainly in the military is that of domestic abuse. So I was raised in that environment. I understand the dynamic that goes with it, um, but we need to get at how we affect those behaviors. So having a violence integration specialist here would certainly help with that. And that will, I will mention that tomorrow to the DOD team. I don't know that we'll get to gender report today. Again, we can set up another time if the session um, schedule allows for it. Uh, I believe we've made remarkable progress when it comes to gender equity in this organization. Again, we're leading the way. Um, I think I've mentioned to the committee before, uh, the Vermont Army National Guard was the first guard state to open a combat arms battalion to the recruitment of women. Historically, two thirds of this organization, because of the combat arms alignment, are not open to the recruitment of women. But we've changed that. Um, and following that, now we are one company, one small unit away from opening the entire brigade combat team to the recruitment of women. And the only thing we require there is one woman leader in the rank of sergeant or above to join that unit. And then we will have two thirds of the organization open that historically haven't been to the recruitment of women. To me, that's significant. Um, we just hired our second uh, female F-35 fighter pilot. Um, she'll be going to training soon. And then again, it's in the report. Uh, there's some subtleties there that won't be reflected. And again, probably worthy of, of another follow-up specifically to gender. Um, 
but the growth of women in leadership positions in both the air and army, um, it's, it's pretty significant and it's a remarkable change in the past two years. So we're looking forward to continuing that trend. And I certainly look forward to working with um, all the stakeholders in this uh, legislatively, um, the Vermont Commission on Women and other entities outside the guard to, to help us uh, continue to grow opportunities for women in the organization. So with that, sir, I will stop. Um, and I'll ask uh, Major Norris and, and Mass Sergeant Hawkins to step out and I'll bring in uh, Ms. Christina Fontaine, who's uh, gonna walk us through the sexual harassment and sexual assault report. The uh, Deputy yeah, Provost yeah. Marshal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got it. Go ahead. Thanks, sir. Um, and I work for uh, Major Norris, who is the Provost Marshal. Um, it's a great privilege uh, to have been selected for this position. Uh, it's the first ever in Vermont Guard. Uh, we are a dual service. Uh, we provide services both through the air and the Army side. Uh, I've been a law enforcement officer since 1999, uh, full-time with Middlebury Police Department. I'm currently a training coordinator and instructor uh, with the Vermont Police Academy. Uh, we had uh, a couple weeks of uh, beating by fire hose and trying to get smart and learning very quickly about a lot of different uh, both opportunities for this position, as well as how we can support the Adjutant General and all of the uh, efforts and initiatives that have been started. Uh, we're working closely with both federal, state, and local agencies to make sure that the lines of communication are both open uh, and available so that, as we find out later on in this discussion, uh, that information is free-flowing and that uh, we can use it as appropriately as possible uh, from our side. Thank you very much. And Ron, I don't know if you, if you got it up front, that Master Sergeant Ken Hawkins, I, I had it muted. Great, thank you. Christina, welcome. Thank you. So uh, as I said, I'm Christina Fontaine. I'm the Joint Force Headquarters Sexual Assault Response Coordinator for the Vermont National Guard. I've been working in the Sexual Assault Prevention and Response Office since 2016. I started as the Victim Advocate Coordinator and um, in 2019 was selected as the SARC so this is my second time actually presenting myself, but I've attended the report uh, for the last four years. Um, so I wanna thank you all for making time. I know in a COVID world, it's a little bit different than the norm where we're in person and we're able to have a lot more uh, back and forth conversation, but uh, I think this is important and we're definitely happy to be able to present this information to you. So our report is divided up into four main chapters, which is the executive summary, our reports, our organizational assessment, and then the addendum. Um, and as General Knight stated, this year the addendum also includes the FY20 gender report. But today we're going to focus mainly on the first three chapters. And um, we can uh, refer to the addendum as needed. Um, and... Uh, that's so that's how that today is going to go. Um, so this report looks at fiscal year 20, which goes from October 1st of 2019 through September 30th of 2020. And during that time, the National Guard consisted of approximately 3,300 members and approximately 1,100 of those were full time. The rest of them were uh, traditional drilling members. So that's the one weekend a month and two weeks in the summer or in out of the year. Um, in fiscal year 20, the Vermont National Guard Sexual Assault Response Coordinator tracked three reports which pertained to incidents that occurred um, in previous fiscal years. Five of our reports were Vermont National Guard service members as the accused. One case involved a civilian survivor and the rest of the cases in, um, involved Vermont National Guard service members as the survivor. Uh, in addition to that, the Equal Opportunity and Diversity Office processed four informal resolution requests and no service members filed reports relating to discrimination based on sexual orientation. <clears throat> and so before we go further into the report, I want to start off with going over a few definitions because there is a difference between the military and the state's definitions of sexual assault. So we've differentiated uh, what those two definitions are and when we're talking about the military's definition of sexual assault, it encompasses five categories, which is rape, sexual assault, aggravated sexual contact, abusive sexual contact, and forcible sodomy, as well as attempts to commit these acts. Um, and if you want further information on those, you can look at page one or page 15 of the report. 
So the Vermont statute <clears throat> includes felony crimes of sexual assault, aggravated sexual assault, and other crimes related to minors. There is a newer state statute, Chapter 13, Section 2601A, which established a misdemeanor, and that similarly aligns with the military's definition of abusive sexual contact. Um, so this, this addition of this statute brought the state's definition closer to the DOD's definition, but the DOD still does provide a bit of a broader um, language, which allows us to take action on um, incidents that might not be taken in by civilian law enforcement. So when a survivor comes forward, they're allowed the option to choose between a restricted report or an unrestricted report. Uh, regardless of which report option they choose, the survivor will have access to counseling, medical, legal, and advocacy services. Um, the main difference between the two options is that a restricted report remains confidential and an unrestricted report will involve an investigation by either local law enforcement or the Office of Complex National Guard, uh, Office of Complex Investigations, which is through the National Guard Bureau. Uh, the Office of Complex Investigations is a team of judge advocates or those with a law enforcement background that are trained specifically in investigating uh, incidents of sexual assault. Um, and if we go to local law enforcement, our OCI is up to the survivor's preference. TAG is the one who actually will submit the request to OCI if that is what the survivor would like to participate in. Um, the survivor also has the opportunity to decline to participate in, in, in either of the investigations and um, we fully support them whichever way that they choose. So there's also a subcategory under the restricted report that is called open with limited. And so this means that there's no official reporting document signed by a survivor. The most common um, case where this is seen is where there's a civilian victim with a military perpetrator because we can't provide services to civilian survivors unless they are dependent of a military member over the age of 18. The other scenario where this would happen is if there's a third party report. So somebody within the unit learns of a sexual assault and they go to their command or to the sapper office and officially file that report on behalf of the survivor who does not want to participate in a report. And then when we're talking about sexual harassment, that's a form of sex-based discrimination that involves unwelcome sexual advances requests for sexual favors, and other verbal or physical conduct um, that is sexual in nature. For more information on the military's definition of sexual harassment, you can look on page 21 of the report. And also later in the report, you'll see reference to formal and informal resolution requests. Both of these are reviewed by the National Guard Bureau following an investigation of unlawful discrimination by an aggrieved party. Uh, the primary difference is associated with the mandatory timelines for formal or informal requests. Um, and if, there, if the complaint is made in writing or not in writing. So that's the, that was the brief overview of the executive summary. Now we're gonna move on to chapter two, which starts on page three, and that's where we get into a lot of our reporting information. So the National Defense Authorization Act from FY11 required that the Secretary of Defense submit an annual report of sexual assaults that involved members of the armed services during the preceding year. Um, so all of the reports that we are showing in here come from our defense sexual assault incident database from FY20. So the graph that is on page three represents each of the reports that we received in FY20. So the color denotes the type of assault that was reported, and then each column report uh, represents the different report types. And the red circles tell you if it was a Vermont National Guard service member who was the reported offender. Any incident that doesn't have a red circle means that the incident um, was one where the offender was outside of the, Na the Vermont National Guard. And one thing that we have on here um, that's different than in other years is that we have one that's an RR to URR. That means that was one that was reported as restricted originally, and then the survivor came forward and decided to go unrestricted to get that investigation. So that's one of our other benefits that we have with that restricted reporting option is the survivor can get the counseling services that they need, the medical services that they need, and then when they feel ready to come forward and get an investigation, they can go unrestricted at any time. 
<clears throat> so the sexual assault prevention response program began in 2010 and of the reports received in FY20, three of the incidents occurred between FY10 and FY19, and three of the incidents occurred within FY2020. Um, so if we look at page four, there's two graphs on this page that are included to address requests from past legislative reports to show historical data. Um, the graphs show all of the reports that we've received since the inception of the program in 2010. If you're looking at the graph on the top of the page, that shows the information based on when the reports were received. And then the second graph shows when the incidents occurred. So any of the reports that occurred prior to 2010 are reports that have come in for people making historical reports because there's now a program for them to come in and get that support. <clears throat> On page five, we have three other charts. And the first two charts are to provide additional information on our restricted and unrestricted reports that we received in FY20. For instance, the top line is case number 00155. <clears throat> and that shows you that the incident occurred in 2020. The survivor who is a female was serving in the Vermont National Guard at the time of the incident as an 01 or the first rank in the officer track. The reported offender was a male who was also serving in the Vermont National Guard, and he was an 03, or a captain, which is the third rank in the officer track. The reported incident in this one was rape. An LOD, or a line of duty determination, is a formal process that affirms that an injury was occurred while in a duty status. Um, most often, this is used for the VA, to determine a disability rating. This survivor has chosen not to pursue an LOD at this time, but she is able to come back at any time to, uh, to go through that process and receive an LOD. In addition, we always provide referrals out to civilian agencies or the VAs or vet centers. Um, for example, Vermont Network programs, um, depending on what county that person lives in. And so both of those first two charts on page five are laid out that way. And then on the third chart, that shows a summary of pending unrestricted cases or cases that have closed since the last time that we provided this report. Um, so the first case, for example, is a carryover from FY17. Um, and it is important to reiterate when looking at this case that the Vermont National Guard has to refer unrestricted reports out to outside entities for investigation first. Um, the survivor chooses whether or not to participate in an investigation that is led by civilian law enforcement um, or if they wanna participate with OCI. So all of those reports that are on that page at the bottom of page five are laid out in that way. The case, the case number, when the incident occurred, what the allegation was and then what the disposition was. So in the first, the first two um, incidents on that page are a waiting process. They're not completely closed yet. And then the last three incidents have closed since the FY19 report. Can we talk through the acronyms for the disposition? Do you want me to do that? If you want to. Well, Mr. Chair, very quickly, if we, if we look at the disposition, um, we live in an acronym world. I want to make clear to the committee so NGB obviously the National Guard Bureau, Office of Complex Investigation is the OCI, but a GOMAR is a General Officer Memorandum of Reprimand. A WOFER is a withdrawal of federal, federal recognition. In essence, you're removing the federal recognition of somebody as a commissioned officer. Um, and then the OTH is an other than honorable discharge. Um, I think that covers those acronyms. Thanks, sir. Great, thank you. And then uh, in FY20, we did not receive any reports from our members serving in a federal Title 10 status. Um, however, that could change for FY21 because we do have members who are deployed on an, a Title 10 status. Um, but in FY20, we did not receive any of those. And so now we're moving on to the sexual harassment portion of the report, which starts on page six.
So as stated at the beginning, our sexual harassment, uh, our Equal Opportunity and Diversity Office received four uh, informal requests for sexual harassment. Um, and that chart is showed at the beginning of page seven. You can look and see if there was incidents, informal requests, and formal requests. And this goes back for the last five years. So you can see from FY16 to FY20, how many of those types of reports we saw. Um, in this page, it's also delineated by color for which fiscal year it occurred in. And then in the middle of page seven, there is the, the chart that's very similar to how the sexual assaults were laid out, where it has the case number, the incident year, the survivor and the accused, and a description of the incident, as well as what happened, what the, what the disposition was. On, on this case, um, the first three are um, finished. The last one on that page was pending investigation as of when this report was um, submitted in January. Uh, in FY20, there were no formal resolution requests for sexual harassment, and again, that just delineates between if the report was made in writing or not, and if um, the timelines associated with that process. Um, and then again, what, on page eight, another part of this report is to testify on if there was any discrimination by, based on sexual orientation. And in FY20, we did not have any informal or formal complaints of discrimination based on sexual orientation. So now we're moving on to the organizational assessment, which begins on page nine. Uh, the Vermont National Guard has developed an assessment strategy based on three measures of effectiveness or lines of effort that are pursued through measures of performance or training events. Um, this is based on the military's information operations doctrine, and it's similar to many uh, public health initiatives that are rolled out on the civilian side. Um, these areas are designed specifically to target protective factors and risk factors for sexual violence that have been um, identified by the Center for Disease Control. We have a full list of what those protective and risk factors are that the CDC <clears throat> recognized on page 21. So the first measure of effectiveness that the Vermont National Guard um, has is to inform service members on how to create a climate where all members feel valued in order to promote well-being, connectedness, readiness and lethality. So on the bottom of the page, you can see an example of the lines of effort, um, who the target audience is and what the risk or protective factor is that is being addressed. On the top line, the effort is annual mandatory training. The target audience is every Vermont National Guard service member. And then the protective and risk factors are labeled with a plus sign or a minus sign. So. For this one, empathy and concern is the protective factor and the risk factors that are being targeted are um, the ones that are with the minus sign. So for example, the lack of um, institutional support. The second measure of effectiveness is protecting survivors of sexual assault in the Vermont National Guard by providing a trauma-informed response from initial report through the resolution in order to promote survivor confidence and resilience. The chart relating to measure of effectiveness number two lists the efforts and an assessment of what the effort entailed. So the first effort was our lean-in circles and a description of what the lean-in circles are are on the right. The other thing that we wanted to highlight is um, the Sapper Council. That's a group of survivors who meet on a quarterly basis to um, look at our policy updates, talk about current happenings within the Guard, uh, talk about current happenings within the world at large um, relating to sexual assault and things that we can do to better our program for new survivors who are coming in and making reports to make sure that we're providing the best um, the best care and the best response that we can. And then also the CATCH program. The CATCH program is something that's relatively new. It gives individuals who come forward and make a restricted report the option to anonymously name their offender or um, give identifying features if they don't know the name of their perpetrator. And then we, there's a group of special, specially trained 
uh, investigators at NCIS who will go through and try to make matches. And if there is a match, somebody else names the same perpetrator, the both survivors are given a notification that somebody else has named the same offender. And this gives the, the survivors a chance to know I'm not alone in this and decide at that point if maybe they would like to go unrestricted because now they're not alone. They know that somebody else has also experienced this. And the survivor debrief with TAG, um, that's something that we've had a lot of great experience with uh, individuals who come forward and maybe they just want leadership to be aware of shortcomings that led to their assault, or they just want leadership to hear their voice and to know what they've experienced and how it continues to impact their service. We sit down with General Knight and um, it usually provides great outcomes. And then General Knight usually follows up with the survivors after our meetings for a couple of months to let them know that they're still on his mind and he's still trying to make things right for them as best as we can. So then the third measure of effectiveness is to engage the Vermont National Guard sexual assault and legal systems to ensure that program and offender accountability um, in order to promote justice, efficiency, and effectiveness. The chart is laid out in the same way that MOE2 was. The effort is in the first line um, on this chart is the Domestic Violence Council and the description is listed on the right. So the Vermont Domestic Violence Council is a statutorily required uh, group that meets usually at the Pavilion Building, although during COVID we've been just meeting through Zoom. Um, but the Joint Force Headquarters, SARC and BAC both attend those meetings. <clears throat> And to ensure that the efforts are accurately working, we measure the program through multiple assessment efforts. Um, those are described on page 12 and 13. So through our inspection programs, unit must, units must demonstrate that they are meeting certain regulatory and state-based guidance. Uh, currently, we have 26 credentialed advocates. Nine also are identified and in different um, phases of credentialing. When we credential an advocate, there's a background screening that happens here within state, and then it also goes up to uh, National Guard Bureau to do more of a national level screening. And then they attend a 80 hour course. And then once they come back, we submit all of their training to the National Org Organization for Victims Assistance, which is a civilian credentialing board that also credentials the military victim advocates. Um, so then we also have an organizational climate survey. Um, this is a commander's management tool that proactively assesses climate areas that can impact the organization's mission. Commanders at squadron on the air side and company level on the army side um, or higher are required to conduct an initial assessment within six months of taking command and then every 24 months after. So it is mandatory for commanders to administer the assessment but it's optional for service members to actually participate in that. So commanders must offer that choice, but we don't force anybody to answer the questions. Um, the DOX is another example of that, which is the Defense Equal Opportunity Climate Survey. It poses 56 questions to measure 21 factors. Um, nine are organizational effectiveness factors, six are equal opportunity and fair, fair treatment factors, and then six are sexual assault factors. We also have the unit risk inventory, which assesses each soldier's risky behaviors, such as alcohol and drug use, delinquency, sexual risk taking, and suicidal behavior. The Center for Disease Control has identified 12 risk factors associated with sexual violence. And of those 12, the unit risk inventories happen to measure four. Um, and because there's a greater, greater than 60% participation rate from the Vermont Army National Guard, the unit risk inventory provides a confidence rate of over 98%. Uh, the trend analysis over the last four years can be seen on the bottom of page 12. And you can see that we're moving in the right direction. Um, people are willing to answer these honestly because they are anonymous. And then finally, our program provides regular updates to senior leaders and key stakeholders to provide statistical data, as well as identified best practices and initiate, um, anticipated initiatives that are coming up between one quarter to the next and throughout the fiscal year. Um, these briefings serve as an opportunity to ensure that there's understanding throughout leadership on what our team is doing 
as well as to hold the programs accountable for their efforts. <clears throat> and then as stated, the addendum contains more detail into the history, the definitions, the evolution of and focus of our programs. Um, and it's provided here for your reference, um, as well as the gender report is in that this year. Uh, pending any further questions, this concludes my portion of the report. Great, thank you, Christina. Um, let's move right to, and thank you, General Knight, for, for teeing this up and for, for getting us off. Um, let's move to, uh, is it Nikki? I, I'm noticing by your phone, or Nicole Sorrell? All right, sorry, I did have to unmute. Um, sure. Yeah, I, I am here as the um, Victim Advocate Coordinator um, in the office I work alongside Christina. Um, I, I, I wasn't prepared to speak, actually. I wasn't sure exactly what my brief is supposed to be on, um, other than I, I support the team. Um, we're doing a lot of great work with SAPM this month. Um, I can certainly answer any questions, or if Christina or General Knight had something specific they wanted me to speak to, I'm happy to do that. Um, uh, Nikki, maybe uh, if you have the opportunity, would you, um, I know some members of the committee who were on the caucus um, had the information from uh, our earlier briefing, but talk a little bit to the, uh, those in the committee who haven't heard it about the, the pledge um, that, that you've uh, put, put together for the Vermont Guard. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, yeah, so April is Sexual Assault Awareness and Prevention Month as we were sort of starting to decide what are we going to do, um, especially in a COVID world. I started doing some research and found a national movement, um, Violence Against Women, uh, that had a pledge that people would sign saying that they're going to start believing people when they come forward um, to, to uh, report a sexual assault. Um, as General Knight said in the beginning, only about one in five people come forward to report. Um, and a lot of that, there's a multitude of reasons why they don't. Uh, but a lot of that does have to do with the fear of not being believed um, and not feeling supported. Um, so I, I read all about this national movement and thought we can do that here. Um, let's really tailor that to the guard. And uh, I created a pledge. Um, we sort of decided a little bit arbitrarily that we were going to name April 7th moving forward was going to be Start Believing Day. And uh, we put out this pledge to leadership, the different units, and said, you know, April 7th, take this pledge and then all month long, keep taking it. Um, show people, show our organization and, and show, you know, the nation really that we're going to support. We are an organization that supports uh, sexual assault survivors. And the pledge has really taken off. It is definitely more than I think we thought it could even be. Um, General Knight was one of the first people to take it. A lot of, most of the leadership team at the Joint Force Headquarters took it. Um, I took this great video this past weekend. I went out to several different units and I know Christina did it at her unit as well, where we have full units that have just taken this pledge and um, are standing in front of a camera saying, I believe, and it's just such a powerful, um, uh, it's a powerful thing to do in general and then to see the reflection back in some of these pictures and these videos and just the conversations that have been stemmed from it has just been really powerful in showing the commitment and the desire that our organization has to to do to do the best they can and show that you know we're an organization that cares and and it's it's been a real we've had a really wonderful response from it Thanks, Nikki. Uh, so, Mr. Chair, one thing that, that came out of this, I went over to our regional training institute this past through a weekend, um, where I believe the entirety of the regiment that was at least at drill signed their pledge. And uh, there was, I, I've, I've spoken with some of my counterparts in other states, and, and some were questioning why we were doing this. Um, and they conflated taking a pledge to believe uh, a survivor that they were somehow a nexus to a presumption of guilt for the alleged perpetrator. Um, I think if you apply the numbers, and, and Nikki, you can validate this if, if I'm off base, 98% um, of the allegations made were substantiated. Uh, and two, not to say that they weren't true, there could be any number of reasons there weren't, wasn't evidence to support. Um, I think that's significant. Uh, I, I think that's vastly different than a presumption of guilt. Uh, you pledge to believe and the system 
as adjudicated, we'll figure out where the truth lies. But the number of 98% coming back substantiated speaks volumes to me. So I felt very comfortable taking a pledge. That's great. Thank you, Nikki. I, in the, the notion of the one in five is something that continues. It's, it's societal. It's not specific to the guard, but it is something that I think is, um, I think that's something that is, is really important to try to create a safe space um, so that people can come forward. You know, low numbers doesn't mean that it's not happening and that's important. I'm, I'm exactly. really glad that you acknowledge that. Yeah. Um, Representative Tron, a quick question before we move on to the next witness. Uh, sure, I just uh, want to ask, uh, I think maybe General Light, um, you touched on um, uh, fear of reporting, and um, it's nothing new in the military that oftentimes the chain of command is not responsive to complaints. So my question is, are we getting through to company commanders and, uh, and uh, platoon sergeants uh, to uh, correct this or to, to uh, reinforce um, their action, uh, the mandatory action that they must take uh, when they get a receiver complaint of any kind? Uh, yes, sir. I, I think we are. Uh, there's there are some things um, that that I see that that are transparent to, to you and the organization. Um, some of the discussions that I'm watching our young leaders have unsolicited. Uh, I didn't prompt the discussion. They're talking about it, um, and I've never seen this level of engagement before. Uh, and, and again, as uh, look, we can order. I mentioned this the other day to the caucuses. Look, we can order training. I can mandate you be there, but I can't make you listen. Uh, but when I see three young company commanders, again, unsolicited, having a professional conversation between the three of them on how they get at it at their level. And they're using terms like, look, we're the beacon of professionalism. We have to be the representative of this organization. That's an indicator to me that we're actually making progress um, across the organization. Uh, now, that being said, the other part of your question there is, is are we reporting? And then this is something that, um, again, I addressed the other day. I don't believe, I'm quite convinced actually, we're not giving our, our up and coming leaders the education and professional development they need to address things like this. Uh, if I look at the Fort Hood report, uh, for instance, one of the significant shortcomings that permeates that is the lack of understanding of the differences between a restricted report and unrestricted report, the timelines that go with those and what you're supposed to do as a leader, what your obligations are. So rather than engaging in these, these large, once every few years professional developments, we're going to go to doing this quarterly. Um, it becomes very targeted and getting it specifically the things we're talking about here and giving them the tools. Um, how do they do non-judicial punishment? How do they administer military punishment for a military offense? How do they take rank? How can they make a member forfeit pay? How can they discharge them properly? Uh, sir, I've been in this organization, this organization, 31 years, and nobody ever sat me down and said, here's how you do it. So I recognize that as a shortcoming. I think we understand we understand that as an organization, uh, but that's the direction we're going. Is, and, and again, I share best practices with other states. Um, we're borrowing some, some, uh, some programs from the Nevada Guard. Um, they've actually, they stood up a, a, a basically a Guard Academy. Um, so we'll try to tailor something like that uh, and make it um, feasible with a timeline, but I, I believe an hour, hour and a half, once a quarter, will very quickly get us where we need to go. It's good to hear, General. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Representative Murphy. Thank you, Chair Stevens. I um, hope this is the time to ask a, this question. I, in looking at the chart on page 12 and 13 with the um, Center for Dis Disease Control Risk Factors Associated with Sexual Violence. I am very pleased to see the progress being made on, on all of those on page 12. But as you flip to 13, it did catch my eye in reading this that um, the suicidal ideation as well as attempted suicide had upticks, which is a reverse of every other point. And I just wondered if there was any specific um, spotlights actions that were being taken to I know it's it's something that 2020 has presented in all aspects of people's lives that this is a concern being seen and I wondered how we were looking at it in the guard yes ma'am thank you for the question uh, so 
Well, I'm also on the General Officer Advisory Council. Uh, there are two task forces, one to address sexual harassment and sexual assault. The other focusing on suicide prevention. Uh, this is a tough one, and this has impacted the Guard uh, across the nation, and certainly COVID hasn't helped with this. Uh, but again, when I look at the, the folks we have working to get at this and some of the innovation that they've brought within Vermont, um, for instance, um, Trish Dempsey, who's our uh, Director of Psychological Health at the 158th Fighter Wing, uh, came up with the idea of doing testimonials. Um, and that's important because look, when I got back from overseas, I was not the same person. I find no shame in it. Nobody comes back the same. So I went to the vet center and I worked with them for two years to get back to at least a normal, more normal semblance of, of what I was before I deployed. If I can't tell people that, how can we expect a junior member of this organization, Air or Army, uh, to seek the help that they need or feel comfortable coming? We have to get at the stigma. Uh, so that's, that's a result of, of Trish Dempsey's efforts and then the team. And we put together uh, eight testimonials. Uh, and there were seven of our members of the Air Guard and, and, and myself. We provided our testimonials. Um, it's probably about a 45 minute presentation. And it was powerful enough. It was for internal consumption. Uh, the wing did what we call a resiliency tactical pause to specifically focus on this. It was directed by the Air Force. They told you to do it, they didn't tell you how to do it. So that was the wing's approach. Uh, but the feedback that we received from our personnel in the Air National Guard was very positive, um, getting at that stigma. So I, I got permission from all of the participants who provided the testimonials. And I shared that with National Guard Bureau. Um, and that is, is just one indicator, one, one vignette of, of how we're working to get at this, is focusing on the stigma. Uh, and then again, consistently reinforcing the message that we have resources out there uh, and to use them. Um, one thing we haven't done, and this is my perspective, if somebody comes to us with a brain health issue, uh, they become not ready. They are not a deployable resource. So we will spend a lot of time working with them, but usually it, it's the scarlet letter. You go in, you talk to a military provider, hey, I've got some things going on and I know how to deal with it. You are now not ready. You have what we call a profile, a duty limiting condition. That's fine, but we're not giving them the tools to become ready. So there's a number of things going on, and some of these are, are, are challenging. Um, we're working, uh, we've gotten on a pilot program uh, through National Guard Bureau. I think we're the only state currently doing it, uh, working what we call NeuroWave. It's a, a, a electronic e-resonance therapy, brain therapy. Um, unfortunately, uh, we've, we've hit a road bump. We have the equipment, we have the folks trained but there are some limitations on what we can do because it's considered human testing as a pilot. So we're working through uh, with National Guard Bureau and the Department of Defense to, to get the appropriate protections in place um, to be able to do that. And that'll take some time. But again, another one of the innovations that our folks have brought forward that I just have the opportunity to share. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Um, up next, Ken Gregg. Thank you everybody for the questions and let's move on to the second half here. Ken Gregg, welcome back. Hey, Mr. Chair, I've got, I've got Ken here with me. Um, oh, he's on his computer. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's dialed in from his office, but he's, he's nothing, nothing to share with the group today, sir. Okay, so do we have, what about um, Major Kafferlin and, and Lieutenant Colonel Ruggiero, were they scheduled to testify? No, sir. Just here in support then? Yes, sir. <laughs> I anticipated okay. questions about process, you know, given the complexity of sometimes the, the military uh, process of adjudication. That's why I asked Major Kaflin to be here. Okay, no, fair enough. Thank you for that clarification. It makes, um, makes me focus from, um, I don't know if you heard my dog, I'm sorry, um, earlier, just a few minutes ago. Um, so I, I would like to, uh, we have two more questions lined up here um, from Representative Walls and then Bloomley. Thank you. Two things. First of all, a comment and then a question. Uh, General, I was very, very pleased to hear your efforts on, on suicide. I had a son-in-law who was an active duty Coast Guard member who had these issues. He did not want to go to his command because he thought it would reflect poorly on his military career. 
he called the military hotline. It was Washington's birthday weekend. They told him to call back on Monday. He didn't make it. So thank you for whatever you can do. Uh, I have a question. I'm curious. When the guard is deployed is and there's an incident, I would assume that's handled by the local command. Uh, what a what role do you as the Vermont Guard do you have in that instance when, when they're deployed? So it's a good question, sir. We have about 950 members. We will have about 950 total um, by the beginning of June deployed on the Army National Guard side. We're just starting to see some of our Air Guard folks come back uh, from their six month deployment. So when we're mobilized, we fall under federal authority. So Title 10. Um, traditional drilling members, we fall under Title 32. When you're in the Title 10, I have no purview. The governor has no purview. You are absolutely right. You are subject to the chain of command and military discipline within that chain of command. Uh, not to say there isn't information sharing uh, going on. So if there is, for instance, and, and Christine, you can protect, correct me if I'm wrong, if there is a, a incident of a sex-based offense um, and, and the survivor goes to the Title 10 sexual assault response coordinator, they in turn will share information with, with Christina. So now we have the information um, that we can take action when the person returns. Okay, thank you. That's what, that, that's what I was curious about, to make sure you were aware of anything that happened. And then you also had the ability to do something about it when that person was back in your command. Okay, thank you. We've yes, also sir. had like some of the historical reports that we've had were from the deployment that Vermont went on in 2010. So people waited until they felt ready to come forward. So that's another op another option that they have is to wait until they are home. But we do hope that they they get those services while they are deployed from the deployment sexual assault response coordinator as well. Thank you. Representative Blumley. Yes, thank you, um, Chair, and thank you all for your testimony. And um, I like um, Representative Walls. I, I have a um, a comment, and then I have a question that I hope isn't too broad. Um, so I'm really impressed um, and and touched by your leadership, General Knight, on the issue of brain health and your willingness to come forward and tell your story and to um, encourage others to do so, to try to promote um, uh, using mental health services and um, kind of openly con yeah, acknowledging um, that this is one of the, um, this is one of the challenges of 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 service um, uh, in in many fields, um, but certainly in the military. And um, anyway, I just I just was really struck by that. So I just wanted to thank you for that. And then the second thing is that um, you know I I know personally the, that you have done a lot of work both in the areas of. Um, <clears throat> sexual harassment and violence, um, and in in terms of recruiting, and you know, lots of good forward motion. And I'm wondering if you could identify the places where you feel you're not doing so well, the places that are uh, continue to be challenging. And um, you know, one of the things, one of the statistics that that is still disappointing to me, and I'm. I just in the broad scheme of things is that only 21% um, of guard members are women. So I, uh, anyway, that, that was one thing that I picked up on. Um, and I, 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 I know from talking to you in the past in my previous lives that this is, you know, I, I know that this is of interest to you and, and, but I wanted to make sure that I didn't, limit it to that like like what are you working on or maybe not able to work on that that you think is a priority and um you want to you want to devote more energy to in the coming months 
That, that's a great question, man. And I, I, ideally, if, if you're not in session on Monday, I'd love to have you over to Camp Johnson or I'll meet you someplace else and talk through in detail some of the things we're working on. Uh, some of it uh, involves the state of Vermont. I'm working with Dustin Degree. Um, I'll make it very succinct. Uh, historically, in my time in this organization, we think too small. We haven't gone big enough. Uh, at no point have we as an organization gone to the Vermont Commission on Women, to the legislature, to the business roundtable, to all of the key players in Vermont, inclusive of state government, and said, hey, can you help us grow the guard? Can you help me grow diversity? Um, if, if I look, and this, again, I'll talk big picture, as an organization, we do not focus sufficiently. And this is the conversation I'm having with National Guard Bureau. Why are we not focusing more diligently on the prior service market? When folks leave the, the service, if they're their first term, they have a service obligation remaining. Why not continue your service in the Guard? By extension, why not continue your service in the Vermont National Guard, either Air or Army? Um, so that's part of it is we need to start selling Vermont. Um, I'll sell the Guard. Uh, that, that we can do. Um, but recruiting challenges, to your point about the demographic, um, I've had significant focus as we have as an organization um, in, in changing the climate and, and changing opportunities for women. So being the first in the nation to open a combat arms battalion, that's a big deal. Um, in fact, we're going to be the first, I'm, I'm certain, in the next few months to open the entire brigade. So two thirds that weren't open now are. The challenge now becomes one of taking and, and building it. Because not every, not every woman who joins the Guard wants to be in combat arms. Those are special niche things. But at least we're giving them the opportunity to do that. Um, and if I look at the success of the Air Guard, that's I think is probably more significant. I look at the Priority One Task Force, which they established, irrespective of rank, gender, ethnicity, race. That group focuses on recruiting. They focus on retention and they focus on diversity and inclusion and, and equity and opportunity. So when I look at the increase, and this to me is, is pretty profound, I have to look at the data, I think it's in the report, somewhere between 25 and 27% of new enlistments into the Air National Guard are women. That's remarkable. Now, if I look at the construct, although 20.5% of the population, about that, it may be a little bit dated, of the population of the Air National Guard are women, when I look at who's in leadership positions, 50% of the group chiefs, these are the E9s, these senior enlisted leaders, leading those colonel level commands are women. 50% of the first sergeants, these are the, the master sergeants or EAs, they're leading airmen, women. Two F-35 fighter pilot candidates, one in training, well, both going in training, one is nearing completion, uh, unheard of. What, I, what particularly speaks volumes to me about the future of the organization is 42.9% of the lieutenants at the fighter wing are women. So look, we're a learning organization and change takes time. Um, when I look at our history, certainly in the Army National Guard side, that's probably the bigger challenge for me right now, is getting at that propensity to serve and giving folks the confidence and, and, and courage to come forward and say, look, I want to serve. I want to step forward. Um, in my view, again, big picture, I'll get off my soapbox here in a moment. We can give you all the reasons to serve. We can give you the incentives. There's plenty of reasons to serve, but I think the question we're not asking is why won't you? And that's where I could probably use the most help is, is getting folks to understand what comes with service in the guard. It's hard. I think we all understand that. Um, it's challenging. But if I look at the response to COVID, where would we, where would we be if we didn't have the guard? 3.2 million meals this past summer with, with, in conjunction with the Vermont Food Bank. And, and we were happy to do that. And we could do more if I had more people. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, thanks. And I'll take you up on, on a, a future conversation. That'd be great. Thank you, ma'am. Representative Trano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, I just wanted to comment on um, this report, your report, General, the uh, actions that you have taken in the two years you've been in office, um, your <clears> staff, well-informed, well-intended. And I just want to um, let you know that that's, that really sits well with me. Um, and your piece on suicide <clears throat> prevention uh, means a lot to me as well. Um, you know, uh, PTSD wasn't discovered as a, as a, uh, as a disorder, uh, 
until 12 years after I returned from my combat tour. And I floundered around with a lot of anger and a lot of uh, issues for that period of time. Episodic depression triggers PTSD um, it, very intensely. And you know, when, that, when you face that, um, it, it just triggers everything and everything goes to hell. So, you know, uh, catching this and, you know, we all know that veteran suicide rates are considerably higher than average individuals. And uh, so the prevention med measures that you are taking for your soldiers when they return from combat tours um, is uh, very heartening for me. Um, having suffered from that for a long time and hoping that other people won't have to suffer as, as long. Thank you, General. Thank you. Happy to do it, sir. And, and you know, sir, th again, this comes back to, I'm frustrated by it, um, but getting that magnet magnetic e-resonance therapy, and I, I am not a behavioral health specialist on the science of it, but what I understand of it is, is this therapy focuses on the areas of the brain where anxiety, depression, uh, PTSD, adjustment disorder resides. Um, sometimes, you know, like in my case, talk therapy isn't enough. Um, and, and this is just a way for us to get it. Special Forces use it. So I'm going to continue to pursue that pretty vigorously. And I'm going to engage our congressional delegation to see if, if we can expedite getting it uh, fielded here. No, thank you. Thank you, General. And I, I mean, this has long been, um, I, I don't come from a military family. I support the people who serve and I support our veterans and I support any programs that are improving to help what happens to folks, not only before they deploy, but after. Um, that's been a real focus, I think, of, of our work here is to make sure, especially during deployments, that, that families are taken care of, that families have the expectations, and, and that when, when um, the individuals come back, that they have some form of um, not just welcoming back from our society, that's a, that's a given, I think, for many of us here in Vermont, but also just what is the institution able to do um, we heard so much, um, especially at higher levels be above, above, above the Vermont National Guard, where it was very difficult for veterans to get the help they needed when they came back. And so whatever we can do on, a, on this level is, is obviously um, much needed. I, I, I would like to return to the 20% um, reporting rate and, and how we approach, I mean, part of, part of building up women in the guard in particular ha having gender equity in the guard of, of some sort is and you asked why don't people serve and you know i have to imagine that in a highly unsafe and a highly unsafe job when when it has to be unsafe um that there's a question of of being normal normalized into the in into the society into your culture and I see you trying to bring more, bring more women in, in particular, in all these different roles. Um, and perhaps sometimes the culture doesn't accept that. And, and I'm just, and then eventually we get to normalization over time. You know, I think that's a normal way of looking at it. But in the meantime, when we see, when we see what you had to deal with, with one individual, and, and you talk about, um, Underreporting, or, or when cases like that happen, and, and, and the guard wasn't aware, you know, I, I wonder, is the support there for the for the survivors who had to make career choices that said this is too dangerous for me, this isn't a safe place for me, just as a workplace, and they might have given up a career, they might have given up a dream, they might have given up benefits that that are. Um, that they thought they were accruing because they had cho they had found a place to be. And I'm just curious what kind of support, what kind of supports can be in place for survivors of, of some of the issues that we're talking about today moving forward, you know, including people who choose to have to leave. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Christina will, will uh, answer at least a portion of that and then I'll add, I'll add something at the end. Um. So with these conversations, I also 
Um, on drill weekends, I'm a member of the guard in the army as a behavioral health specialist. So that is, a, we have a team of us that actually go out to units and provide behavioral health support on those drill weekends. So it's not waiting until you're out to go to the VA or waiting until you're back from deployment so you're completely broken and um, try to help build up before anything really awful happens. Um, for example, I went down to DC at the request of the leadership that was down in DC as a behavioral health specialist. They specifically requested, hey, this might be something that we need. Also, you're a victim advocate. So in case something happens, we have you here. You can provide training to make sure we try to prevent any assaults from happening, as well as make sure that our soldiers are okay. Because a lot of the people who went down to DC were going on the deployment that's coming up. Um, so we wanted to make sure that our soldiers were getting that support and care that they needed before it becomes a bigger issue. Um, as for survivors, when they experience something, uh, if they come forward and ask for help, then that's what we, our advocate team is wonderful. Um, our full-time staff is always on 24 seven to try to provide that help. And we hope that we get to a point where people feel comfortable enough coming forward immediately after a report so that we can help try to prevent them from leaving a a position that they absolutely love or leaving the guard entirely. Um, we, we'd like to have more people who want to do the job and want to do it well and don't want to hurt others rather than keeping perpetrators. I think it's shown really clearly to me since I've been in this position that leadership here doesn't want to keep the perpetrators around if they are, if it is substantiated, if they are found guilty, if there's enough to show that there's any reason to kick them out, that's that's what the leadership is going to try to do. But I think what, what's important there, Mr. Chair, is again, coming back. Um, one, we haven't shared the status of, of a case according to the timeline for a survivor. Uh, we're going to fix that. And again, that comes back to education. And again, big picture, we're not sharing closure uh, with the force. Um, there's no deterrent effect if they don't know what's going on. So uh, to get at that, that's pretty straightforward. This is what happened. Um, we're redacted to such a degree that Privacy Act information is, is protected. Um, but I think folks need to know that somebody of X rank from the Army National Guard did the following thing, and this was the outcome. Um, and I'll come back to what Christina said as to taking care of our survivors. Um, it's a hard conversation. It's hard for them to come forward. The importance of this, I really can't understate this. When I look at our most recent incident, because that survivor came forward, two additional came forward. Uh, and, and the leopard doesn't change their spots. Um, they are who they are. And we didn't make them. They came to us that way. They brought their experiences, their upbringing. Our job is to the degree we can change the behavior. Sometimes we're not gonna be able to do that. And that's probably my greatest frustration, especially with two thirds of the organization as a part-time force. Uh, we don't have purview over them. Um, one weekend a month, two weeks a year, um, what they do, during the rest of the month, we won't see it. Um, as noted on occasion, that's not reported. Um, number of occasions, depending on, on the crime. Uh, but we're working to fix that. And again, getting at the education piece and making sure that those commanders and those senior non-commissioned officers take the appropriate action when needed. When, and you'll notice that there's you know, relatively uh, slim reporting on sexual harassment or reports of any type of harassment. I'm not naive. I, I, it's out there. And I think our units and our leaders are doing the right thing. They're addressing it at the unit level, which is what we want. Be a leader, stop the action, counsel the person. The problem is it doesn't get to Mr. Jameson for reporting. So I don't have a valid reporting mechanism. I can tell you anecdotally that that reporting is probably, it's probably underreported. Uh, so again, a matter of education, good job. Thank you for addressing it. Report it. No, thank you for that. I, I said it's it's a real, um, you know, it just that the equity goes, you know, in making sure that that all soldiers have that have that place where they know that they're being heard, um, and again feel like they're they're safe, um, especially when it comes to this this kind of reporting. Um, we have two more questions here. We have uh, Representative Hango and Bloomley. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate hearing in depth about the results of the outcome of this report. Um, 
I want to go back for a minute to the recruitment and retention, which really is um, a lot of what you were talking about, just in terms of how to um, how to better support your force um, and in the mission that they do. Um, I just I do want you to know that we are doing what we can to really try to. Um, talk more about military careers to, to youth and um, just to, to really bring awareness to people throughout the state um, that the Guard is, is a wonderful career to have if you're so inclined. And I think that's what, what maybe communication has been missing for a long time. And I know we've had conversations about this, but I really, I, I wanna thank you all because you do bring a lot to our state and we're really grateful for that. And whatever we can do to help try to, to um, foster that recruitment and retention please let us know what we can do. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Representative Bloomley. Hi, yeah, thank you. I'm, I just wanna ask one follow-up question that has, this is unrelated to what I, what I asked before. And, and this relates to something that you talked about in the National Guard Caucus and here, which is the um, kind of a check to the self-report um, requirement if, um, and uh, you know, I, I'm, so how well do you, how well do you think that that system is gonna work? You know, will, will law enforcement, I mean, are, are, the, are the pieces in place to make it um, possible for you to regularly get those, well, let's hope you don't get them regularly, but, but you know, um, is, is that going to be a, a difficult process to get law enforcement on online with that, or is it just a matter of um, being plugged into a database? Um, and I, I realized that I was unclear about that. Well, thank you for the question, ma'am. I think it's a little bit of both. I think one is a system issue. Um, so I believe fairly soon, perhaps by one October, um, civil law enforcement in Vermont will be going over to a system called Valcor, which is a computer-aided dispatch system. So it re reports engagements within, um, within the state system. So it's actually recorded. There are numerous systems um, that our folks will have access to. The question or the concern for us is, is to make sure that we are doing it properly. There has, to, in most cases, as I understand it, and speaking with Major Norris, there has to be a reason to do a background check. Now, whether that becomes a, a letter from me to the head of whoever runs the respective program asking, they're in the military, yes, there's an expectation of privacy, but there's also an expectation of conduct. And if I can find the reason, let's find out what I don't know. Um, and if we can do that habitually, once we get the first push out of the way, um, I think that will become kind of our, our standing operating procedure. The other side of this, and one thing I've learned here, um, it's great. I've communicated with Commissioner Sherling to the heads of law enforcement agencies. I think they'll certainly be on board with adding to their process, asking that question, are you a member of the Vermont National Guard? Uh, what I don't understand is who actually sets policy for law enforcement. Is it the Criminal Justice Training Council? Is it the Attorney General? Or do they make recommendations? Uh, wh where does it actually reside? Uh, I think the request has been, been met certainly with support. Uh, they understand it. And again, having the provost marshal team making that and building that habitual relationship is going to go a long way. Um, and I think the longer we do it, the more comfortable we become with it. It becomes routine. And again, it becomes a deterrent. Um, you might get arrested civilly. You got bigger problems than that. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. All right, any further questions on the sexual assault report? Um, at this time, um, I, I would like to thank the um, um, everybody from the Guard who came, but also who came to the National Guard Caucus as well. Um, it's a whole different audience than I think you're usually able to get to within the state house. And so I appreciate that, that you were able to make the time to do that with them as well. Um, the 
that's kind of the reason why we have the caucus going is to make sure that more people understand the issues in front of the guard and, and how we interplay with the legislature. So thank you. Um, General Knight, any, any closing comments or from anybody on your team just about, um, I'll, I'll defer to the team first, Mr. Chair. I would say again, uh, you know, time being what it is, if there's any time remaining in, in, in the session, we're happy to follow up on any other areas uh, that we're, we're not answering questions. Or if you have follow-up questions, you can certainly reach out to us and we'll respond to you uh, fairly quickly. Um, may take a few days if it's something that's data research intensive, but we're happy to do that. Uh, anybody else on the call have anything to add to the committee? So hearing none, uh, last thing I'd, I'd offer, uh, Mr. Chair, and it's the same thing that I mentioned to the, to the caucuses, uh, there's a reason I asked for uh, a legislative caucus. Um, I, I think historically, as long as I've been in this organization, we haven't had a great deal of, of sustained engagement with the legislature outside of, outside of the committee construct. And I think that hasn't done us any favors. Um, I, I think this is a good construct. Um, what's important in this for me uh, at least in my view, is we're setting the conditions, whoever comes after me in this job, there's an expectation of communication. Um, and there's a level of communication that has to come with the position. So uh, we're here, you don't get to go back. And, and I think that's important. Uh, when I, and again, I mentioned it to the caucuses uh, the other day. When I speak to my counterparts in other states, they're absolutely fascinated by how we're doing things. Um, when I tell them I, I asked for a legislative caucus, they're like, a what? It's, it's important. Um, and they're actually taking notes. So again, I think Vermont's doing a lot of things right and we're sharing those best practices. So again, thanks to everybody. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And thanks to all members of our team uh, for taking time today. And I see one more question from Representative Byron. Close it out, Representative. Not a question, not a question, but thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, apologies for missing a portion of the meeting earlier. Um, I was in our tax committee discussing amendment that actually has a relevance to military and the guard, ironically. But I just wanted to get, uh, reiterate a lot of the points General Light just made in his closing. Um, the organization is doing a, an outstanding job with addressing these issues head on. The level of transparency um, that I've seen and what others have seen who have been here longer than me um, is, is genuinely amazing. So I just wanted to commend you on the good work. I mean, there's a lot of work left to be done. This is a, a massive endeavor, but um, I just wanted to share those thoughts and say thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. All right, General Knight team, thank you so much for your time. Um, we are uh, grateful for the report. We will take a look at it, obviously, a little more closely. <laughs> Um, if we do, if and when we do have questions, I mean, with all of the deployments going on, uh, you know, again, to the concerns that preparations are made and, and, you know, all the accommodations that are needed for families and for members to transition back and forth is very important. Um, and for, in order to help them make sure that their service is, is done with as few distractions as possible, given, given where they are. Um, but thank you so much for your time and we will be in touch as always. Outstanding. Thank Thanks, you. Mr. Chair. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Committee, Ron. Ron, are we on a kind of a um, letting the next witnesses know that we're available uh, situation here or are they coming in at a set time? Um, I can do both. Uh, you know, this time of year, I give people a range. I think I told them between 1045 and 11, because we had allotted uh, up to 90 minutes for this hearing. So it's 1037 now. I would assume you're going to take a break. Yes, we are. Um, and I will, us... In the meantime, I will, I will message the two that we're taking a break and that we'll be back in. At 10 of. 10 of. Very good. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you in a little minute.